can't listen to him. He, I get confused listening to him. But I listen to the city of Philadelphia, state of Pennsylvania. I listen to those updates. I listen to the ones in Jersey as well. And, you know, the curve is flat. Amen? Amen. And we can see that um, the social distancing is working, and those kinds of things, and keeping our hands clean, and making sure that we take care of one another in that way, we can see that it's working. Amen? And so let's keep that going. All throughout the week, let's keep our social distancing going. And, I, and I'm so glad because it means the number of deaths are going down as well. Amen? And let's pray. I, I want us to pray. I want us to pray. I want us to pray that there will be a door opened up for testimony. Amen. For the many people who have gone through this process and come out on the other side. Amen? Because, you know, when you look at something, it used to be if somebody said, uh, you want to catch Luke about I'm just giving it a name, Luke about Right? <laughs> 95% of the people with Luke about them live. Yeah. And 5% of the people who have Luke about them die. You would be, well, oh, I'm going to be all right. <laughs> you wouldn't be scared. Well, 95% of the people who get COVID-19 live. And so we want to make sure that we bring those testimonies out. So that people will begin to be encouraged. That even though they may be infected by it, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And, uh, uh, Linda Derrickson sends you her love. Uh, I know you remember Brenda Derrickson did a home going last week. And Linda was in the hospital with COVID-19. And yesterday, I believe, yesterday or today, they released her from the hospital. Yeah. Amen. So she's come out on the other side giving God all the praise and all the glory through the whole process. And so let's continue to pray. You know, I, I, I'm telling you, I'm constantly praying against the spirit of death. I just don't believe that if we do what's proper, that everybody will die in the numbers that they've been predicted. And let's pray that, you know, even as things loosen up, that we all don't run out into the street so quickly. Amen. Amen. Some of us can't wait to get out of the house. You save a little bit of money since you've been in the house, right? Amen. You ain't ran out to the store to get a cheeseburger, you go to the cell. So, if, you know, you save a little bit of money. This is, you know, look at the good things that are coming out of this, and don't be so quick. Uh, I saw something online just before I came out of here, and uh, I just had to laugh a little bit. Because, you know, in Georgia, they opened up all the barbershops, the beauty salons, and the nail rest. And you know, a lot of that is in African American communities. And so, you know, the governor didn't talk to the, the, the mayors of all the cities. And he just went on and did it without even conversing with his mayors. And so somebody called the governor's office to say, well, listen, since everything's open, can we have a tour of the governor's mansion? Because usually it's open for tours. And he said, no. <laughs> That should tell you a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. But I want you to know that there will be never be a comfortable time to reopen our economy. Yeah. You have to know that. There will never be a comfortable time to reopen the economy. And you're going to have to reopen the economy. People have lost their jobs, have lost health care. People need jobs that can give them health care. And so you have to know that sooner or later, we're going to have to open up America. And in that process, some people will still get COVID-19. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. There's no need for us to, you know, think in terms of, well, y'all just want to open it up to make money. Well, some people do. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that that's not true. But if you keep, just keep thinking in those terms that you're trading off making money for people's lives, then you're going to miss the whole scope of the whole economy of America. And America is a capitalist country, and this is how we survive. We are a superpower, not simply because of our might. We're also a superpower because of our economy. 
This is the land of the free, the home of the brave, so they say. And so there will be an opening of America. I just pray that we reopen it right and carefully. But it has to happen. And we need to get used to that idea that it has to happen. And I think we need to do it strategically. And so far, nothing really has been done too much strategically. But let's make sure we do it strategically. Let's pray to our governors, our mayors, uh, our Washington officials will have a good, clean strategy across the board where everybody will benefit from opening back up our economy. Amen? This is not an easy decision to make. It really isn't. And even though the numbers are low in those who will perish from COVID-19, we find that it affects our seniors a lot. And that is something for us to be prayerful about. Amen? We saw the 91-year-old woman who went through COVID-19 and came out of the hospital. You know, that should be rejoicing. Amen? That should be rejoicing. But we do know the numbers are high among those in nursing homes and those kinds of facilities. And we need to be praying against the spirit of death even in that situation. Amen? But let's pray that we do this strategically and God will get the glory out of it no matter how it happens. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. Your word is a light unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. God, we just pray today that as we delve into your word, that as we spend this time together in your word, that you will edify and strengthen us and equip us, that we would live this life in such a way that it will draw others to the bleeding side of Christ. God, we just thank you for these words. I am this precious book. They are the words of life. They are the words of eternal salvation. And we thank you, Lord, that we're able to delve into them and the Holy Spirit gives us understanding. So we bless you for our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Turn with me to the book of Mark, the 10th chapter, as we're continuing on in the book of Mark. Now, today is the 26th, right? 26. I got to make sure that I update this. Uh, today is the 26th, and this is part 103. <laughs> we, we get stuck in certain areas when we talk, when we go through the Gospels. Amen? Mark the 10th chapter and the 17th verse. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running. And kneel. I want you to, I want you to just picture all of this stuff in your mind, because you have to remember crowds came to Jesus. And this man can get close enough to run up to him and kneel to him. I want you to, when you read these passages, I want you to picture yourself in this time that's taking place. When he was gone forth into the way, they came one running and kneeled to him. And asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There was none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. I'm thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. I love that. And said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and said to his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? 
And his disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Now, notice what he said. He didn't say because you have money. He said you trust in riches. Are y'all hearing me? Remember, the root of all evil is the love of money. Verse 25. Is it easier? I mean, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. They were astonished out of measure. Now, whenever you see that they were astonished out of measure, it means Jesus just said, just said something that is absolutely shocking. A lot of times people think that they're talking about the eye of the needle uh, as you would enter into Jerusalem where the captains had to get on their knees and pull them through. That wouldn't be astonishing because that could happen. You understand? That wouldn't be astonishing beyond measure. Jesus is actually saying, a camel through the eye of a needle. Just like he said, say to the mountain, be thou removed. This is astonishing talk that Jesus said. They were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? You see, if you were just talking about the camel getting through the eye of a needle then of a portal, you know some people can get through that. But here he's saying, well, you know, if you, you got to get a camel through the eye of an actual needle, you can't get saved. Amen. So he said unto them, who can be saved? And Jesus looking upon them saying, with men it is impossible. But not with God. For with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say unto him, and, and I love the way Pastor Hinton used to bring this out, because Jesus just said some deep stuff, and Peter said, but well, what about us? Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive. Listen to this. A hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. And in the world to come, eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. In today's text, once again, we find Jesus on his way to Jerusalem for the very last time. The feast of the Passover and unleavened bread was approaching quickly. Here this rich young ruler comes seeking God for eternal life. In this event, the lesson we learn is many of us will find it hard to be sold out. I want to say that again. The lesson we learn is this. Many of us will find it hard to be sold out. We'll find it hard to be all in for Jesus, the gospel, the church, and the kingdom. For some of us, the care of this life will choke the word of God. And we will live an empty existence trying to enjoy our things. Matthew, Luke, and Mark identify this gentleman as rich, as young, and he is a ruler. Thus we call him the rich young ruler. To become a ruler, one has to be well versed in the Torah, live a life of good morals, character, and integrity, integrity, and was usually a middle age to an older man. He normally had enough experiences in his journey to qualify him as such. Howbeit, this young man seems to be unique. He has reached his low status for ruler as a young man. Glory to God. He appears, he appears to be an overachiever. Was he born into wealth? We don't know. Did he earn his 
well. We don't know. Did his money buy the position of a ruler, or did he rightfully earn it? We don't know. But for sure, he seems sincere. Glory to God. He is asking about eternal life. He doesn't come and ask Jesus a bunch of dumb questions trying to trap him. No, he seems genuinely wanting to know how he can secure himself in eternal life. And this is really a salvation question. Can I really be saved and get eternal life? It's like the jailer. Remember the jailer after Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises and God rocked the house and got them free. The jailer said, what must I do to be saved? It's really that same kind of process. Which actually begs the question for us, how many people inside or outside of the church are really seeking God? Many people come seeking purpose and passion. And these are noble things. The meaning of life, fulfillment, and happiness. Many come because they see the church as a career opportunity. Even through the church, people seek fame and fortune. Some come seeking friends with benefits. Mm-hmm. They want to be all here. That's okay. Some come for significant others, and sometimes people actually come looking for spouse. Some people come for community involvement and civic advocacy. But very few people come seeking God himself. Hmm. Romans 3, verse 10. Paul begins to address this thing in Romans 3, verse 10. He says, as it's written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 11 says, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Verse 12 says, they are all gone out of the way, and they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. The truth be told, many of us came to church just to get rid of some stress or some emotional or mental pressure. We wanted to overcome some habit, some addiction, some family trouble, some stress, some loneliness, some depression, or just some kind of relief from our day-to-day -day situations. We were a mess, and we were coming for ourselves. We weren't coming for God. We were coming because we knew God had the power to rid us of our pain, of our trauma, of our self-destruction. Which supposes the question, does this young man see God 
or the essence of God's glory in the presence of Jesus Christ? All of these are questions. Because we know that he's somewhat like Nicodemus. Except that he comes in the daytime. Nicodemus came at night. And he's seeking answers for himself. We know that God our teacher comes from God. And he knows that there's the essence of godliness around Jesus. He never fell down at any other rabbi's feet. But he sees something in Jesus that's different. And he comes and he falls and calls the good master. Hallelujah. This rich young ruler out of Jesus and took a posture of reverence, worship, and submission. But Jesus go on to give him a summary of the Decalogue. The, the summary of the Decalogue, we used to have that when we were uh, in the AME church and we would be uh, in communion time. And there was this liturgy, and the liturgy uh, couldn't last over maybe a half an hour <laughs> at communion. And but then my father would do something called the summary of the Decalogue. It's still the Ten Commandments, but it's a shorter version. Are y'all hearing me? Jesus began to download the commandments. Especially being a ruler, he knew that he knew the commandments. Although he was young, he's a man of religious stature and prominence. Jesus quickly outlines six of the Ten Commandments, and he stops. Now, the young man boldly says, These things have I kept from my youth. Now, I want to tell you that with a statement of arrogance, because nobody has been able to keep the law. But he saw himself as being perfect, as him being flawless. And he said to Jesus, these things have I kept from my youth. Matthew says, the young man then asked the question, so what else am I like? <laughs> these things I've kept from my youth, you know what I mean? I got it all. I did it all. So what else is that? This is a good exchange that opens up some realities in this young man's life and for our life. First of all, if you're born in sin, no one can keep the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law and nail sin to the cross. This young man was thinking through his flesh, yet, yet asking a spiritual question. In his mind, he saw his life as perfection towards the law of God. He thought his efforts were flawless. He was naive. And there's some pride here that also needs to be dealt with. The second thing is we notice in his answer is his emptiness. He asked two questions. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life and what do I have? Oh, hallelujah. You see, once he asked those two questions, we know that he knew something was missing even though he thought he had done it all. Oh, that's important for us to understand. These two questions reveal the depth of emptiness in his heart. It's like him saying, I'm successful, but I'm not satisfied. After all I've acquired in my young life, I feel like I'm lacking something. I don't know what it is, but, and I'm not sure if I will make heaven. I have a lot of knowledge, but it only seems to be that only knowledge. My knowledge is not brought me to a deep awareness of my spirit and my destiny. To me, he's like many demons in the daylight. He's full of questions with no answers. And religion has not saved him. See, you can get to the place where church can become religious to you. And you'll be empty. You can get to the place where it becomes a ritual to you. And you'll be empty. You can get to a place where you go through the motion. And you'll be empty. See, this young man had all of this word around him, learned all of this word, but it did nothing for his spirit. He was just learning. It wasn't, listen, it wasn't so much that he was he wasn't smart. I'm pretty sure he was a pretty smart fellow. But he hadn't submitted to the spirit of God. You see, a lot of times you can learn a lot of stuff in church, you can learn a lot of scriptures, you can learn a lot of things, but if you don't submit to the spirit of God, God will. Because the Holy Ghost is the teacher. The Holy Ghost is the illuminator. The Holy Ghost is the revelator. He will reveal it unto you. And without the Holy Spirit, you can read this word all day long and you won't find nothing to move you. Even Solomon said, reading books, there's no end. 
and do that work that he called us to do. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Religion didn't make him feel whole. Religion was something he could do without God. Oh, you got to hear me now. Because it's easy to have church without God. It's easy to go through a process without God. Religion gave him status, but it had not lifted his spirit closer to God. Religion and rituals have become idols that can't live. Religion had only informed him, but it had not transformed him. He knew it all, but he didn't know God. And in the presence of Jesus, he knew it. See, I think about this guy. He knew Jesus was different. He knew that he wasn't trying to be some rabbi just to be impressive to other people. That when Jesus was speaking and Jesus was doing things, miracles were happening. Demons were being cast out. Lives were being changed. People were being healed. He knew Jesus was different. Jesus was something he had never seen before. And he said, I'm going to come to this rabbi and see if I can find the answer to eternal life. Because everything I'm doing right now has still left me empty. Let me come to Jesus. Romans 8, verse 3, this is what Paul says. Because this man was a student of the law. Paul says, for what the law could not do is that it was weak through the flesh. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Galatians 3, 23 because Paul is an expert when it comes to dealing with the law versus grace. And Paul lets you know you gotta walk by faith. You don't walk according to the law. And a lot of the Jews wanted people to get circumcised. And Paul said, no, 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 they don't need to be circumcised. They came to Christ by faith. They came to Christ in the spirit. How will they not be perfected in the flesh? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, that's a message for all of us. That once we come to God in the person of Jesus Christ, and we come by faith, we will never be perfected according to our flesh. We must be perfected through the spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Galatians 3, 23. Paul says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ and have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. This process of the law, bringing mankind to faith in Christ, is happening in real time in this young man's life. I want you to get that. Because it's happening in real time. This young man is actually seeing the transition that's taking place from the law to faith, to grace, to believing on Jesus Christ. Because Jesus, Jesus comes to fulfill the whole law. And this young man has been asking this question. I know the law. I know the law. I know the law. But I'm empty on the inside. And I want to know what will it really take for me to gain eternal life. And Jesus being eternal life himself. Oh, hallelujah. In him is life. Let me tell y'all something. He was talking to the eternal life. And Jesus actually showed him the next dispensation to come in a conversation. He's not aware of it yet, though, because Jesus is taking us from the law into grace. Are y'all hearing me? Oh, hallelujah. His hunger for a deeper existence in this world is happening as he so desired. He has managed to get personal time, one on one with Jesus, and he knows Jesus is inherently good. Jesus is trying to usher him into the next dispensation of grace. Yet he can't recognize it apart from his temporal existence. I want, you, I want you to understand that. That sometimes what you've been praying for, God sets right in front of you. 
But if you got your mind on so many things of this world, you'll see right past it. And right now, this young man is in that place. He can't really see past his temporal existence, yet he wants eternal life. Let me tell you how some time there's, con there's conflict in your spirit. And he's dealing with this conflict going on in his spirit. He's got the law, but he doesn't have salvation. He's got the law, but he's still empty. He's got the law, and he still has no purpose and meaning to life. He needs to know, what do I need to do to secure my place for the God? Woo, hallelujah. Are y'all with me? You know, it's a bad day when you get a private audience with God asking to give you a written word for your life. Then God gives you that word, but you can't accept what God is saying, even though you ask for it. See, we can be fickle like that. He came to God asking God, he came to Jesus asking for something particular. And Jesus gives him something particular for himself, but he can't accept. You see, sometimes we say we want certain things from God, but let me tell you something. We don't really want it. We don't really want it. We like the sound of God. You know, we, we see it with somebody else's life, and we want what they have. But we're not willing to sacrifice to get it. We're not willing to pay the cost to get it. You see, where's the bad day when you and I pray and God show me this? God talk to me. God send me this. God show me that. And then when God show you, and then you do nothing with that, it's a bad day to have a private audience with God and then ignore what God says. Mm. Are y'all with me? Tell somebody, we can be fickle like that. Jesus now takes an attitude of love towards this young man and gives him the answer he's been looking for. Woo! Isn't it something that the answer that you've been looking for is the answer you don't like? <laughs> That's a rough thing, isn't it? The answer that you've been looking for is the answer you don't like. Mm. Glory to God. Jesus said, do that one thing. Sell all that you have. Give the proceeds to the poor. Expect your treasures to be in heaven. Take up the cross and follow me. <laughs> Jesus was saying, listen, listen to me carefully now. Jesus was saying, focus on me. Remember, he asked the question, what do I need to do to gain eternal life? And once Jesus gave the son of the dead law, he said, these things are not kept for my youth. What do I lack? Jesus said, let me tell you what you lack. Focus on me. Your focus is on things. But if I can get you off of the things and you focus on me, you'll have eternal life. Are y'all with me? Because it even gets better than that. <laughs> Jesus would basically say, place your faith in me and you'll have eternal life. Jesus knew his faith was misplaced in his finance and in his status. Those things that become idols in his heart, listen, and Jesus knew it. Also the very act, I want you to get this, also the very act of selling all those things and giving it to the poor would have been an act But their money did not 
to drive their hearts. Amen. Jesus is saying that with all the distractions we have in the world, and then we have a lot of money, it is very difficult for some people to reason past their money. Jesus said it's hard for some people to read. You know, some people can't have the money. Y'all know that, right? Some people can't have the money. They see, they see a lot of money, they lose their mind. They don't understand that money is just a tool. Amen. As long as you have a full belly, I can tell you right now. Yesterday, on the day before, Friday, the Friday, Friday, Pastor Sasha put him a pot of beans. What you talking about? With some rice. I didn't need no steak and lobster. My God, just take me. Oh, Lord. Let them beans cook on a no fire. Put a big old hand bone in here. Yeah, yeah. Oh! <laughs> Glory to God. I didn't need no steak and lobster. All I need was a bowl. Give me a bowl. Give me a bowl. Give me a bowl with some rice. Oh, glory to God. Amen. You see, you don't, you, you don't need a whole lot of stuff to be happy. Hmm? Bad beans go a long way. Talk about we hungry. Well, I don't want that. Then you ain't hungry. You see, that's what my mother used to say. We used to say that. But my mother, do you like this up? Or you can eat when you like this up? Or you, you know, you eat it normally, but today you just didn't feel like it? You see, you weren't grown enough not to feel like it. You understand? See, I can go in my refrigerator, my refrigerator. Amen. And I can sit in my refrigerator and decide I don't want none of that. I pay for it. But as a child, <laughs> mom will tell you, if you don't want that, you ain't hungry. Because that's all that's going to be here. Because I know you need it. She didn't force you to eat stuff you didn't like. Amen. Because you don't know, nobody has all food, right? But if you had something on that table that you normally eat, but today you just didn't feel like it, guess who went hungry? And guess who didn't worry about? Mildred ain't even worried about it. She didn't even care. I didn't fix all this food. You ain't gonna eat. That's on you. Amen. Yes. You know what we did, right? Where the beans? We went on the end. This is an act of repentance. And remember in Luke 9 18, remember Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus encountered Jesus in a sycamore tree. And then went to Zacchaeus' home. And Zacchaeus became repentant. The Bible says in Luke 9. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I will give to the poor. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I will start him fourfold. In other words, Jesus didn't even have to ask him to repent. He was so impressed by Jesus, he automatically repented. Yes, yes. You see, that's how it is sometimes when God says something to your soul, ain't nobody got to tell you nothing. You just do what's right. You fall in line with the Holy Spirit. You line right up with God when you hear God's voice for yourself. You, you line right up, and, and, and Zacchaeus line right up with the Spirit of God. Here Zacchaeus is a rich man walking in repentance because he encountered the Christ. Oh, hallelujah. This was an answer his soul needed to have. Tell somebody sometimes you get an answer that your soul needs to have. See, sometimes we want answers for something we want to have. Amen. But this guy got the answer his soul needed. Mm -mm -mm. Jesus spoke what this man needed to hear. Repentance began in you and down the road you walk in eternal life. And yet, this very clear answer makes him sad. And he walks away. Now, I want you to get this in your picture. I want you to picture this in your mind. I want you to get this in your head. I don't want you to never forget this. How does he come to Jesus? He comes to Jesus running. Just hold 
just what you need and you push it aside. It's a bad day. He doesn't engage Jesus in any more conversation. <laughs> he suddenly with all his hunger for eternal life becomes speechless. He abruptly ends the dialogue and walks away. I want you to get this in your mind. Because if you really listen, I believe the young man was sincere, but I believe that he had his mind on things more than he had on God, even though he was trying to get eternal life. Are y'all hearing me? Let me tell you what he did. He never asked a question after Jesus said what he said. He never said, Lord, that's, that's kind of hard. How do I just give up everything? I mean, how? I mean, even Gideon said, can I put out a fleece? <laughs> you know what I mean? When stuff, when stuff don't sit right with you and your spirit, this is not a time to walk away from Jesus. You have to take a check. This is the time to talk to Jesus. Nicodemus comes by at night. He says, we know your teacher comes from God. No man can do these things except God be with him. Nicodemus is going on and he tells Nicodemus, Nick, you got to be born again. Nick, don't walk away. Nick says, how can this be? How can a man get back to his brother's womb? He said, no, we talk about the young born of the spirit, Nick. I mean, he, and Nick is engaging him because Nick wants to know. You see, if you come to Jesus and he engages you and start talking to you, you better talk back to him. Don't walk away from the very conversation that will change your life. Even though God has said something, you don't want to hear. And if you walk with God, when they left the time, there will be many times God will say stuff you don't want to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody who says, God always give me my answer. God always, God, uh, everything for me is yes. You ain't walking with this God. You ain't walking with this God. <laughs> this God knows our hearts. Yeah. This God knows what we have problems at. Sometimes God will put something in front of us to challenge us to get something right in us. Oh, hallelujah. Are y'all with me? He becomes speechless. He abruptly ends the dialogue and walks away. He wanted an answer that was easy, that didn't require sacrifice. He wanted an answer, he wanted an answer that would cost him nothing. He couldn't imagine living a life of faith just dependent on the Holy Spirit. He was locked into what he had. Yeah. <laughs> 
You get enough money, you'll be happy. You don't know that it's proven that somebody can win the ten million dollar lottery, and they're happy for about six months, and because they haven't changed their spirit, you understand? They act the same way they act when they want a nine to five job. Many times they blow it off because they're not used to money. They don't see it as a tool that is. And I know some of y'all say right now, well, give me the tell you. Give me the tell you. I'll show them. I'll show them. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm with you. I'll say the same thing. The Bible says he actually walked away. Listen. Greed. Tell us about greed. This word for greed means that he was in a state of distress and heaviness. Jesus said, You want to turn by? Take all these goods you got. So, give it to the poor. Now you can be treasure in heaven for that. Now I want you to take the cross. And I just want you to follow me. Okay? That means greed to the spirit. Let me tell you something. When God tells you to just put faith in me and that greed you, that's a problem. Especially when you know he's God. He knows this, Jesus is a rabbi of all rabbis. He knows that where Jesus knows things is happening. He, he's heard the reports. He's seen stuff. He didn't just come across Jesus that day. The report has been out. This man, the angel of Jesus is ministry. Jesus has been walking for about three years on the earth now. He has heard so much about Jesus. He has seen the testimonies. When he talked to Jesus, he expected something to happen. And the very thing that needs to happen is his repentance. But he's not ready to repent. <laughs> he's distressed. The word of God vets his soul into a state of distress and heaviness. Jesus, just the thought of Jesus' instruction shocked him. Made him anxious and gave him mental pain. <laughs> this word from Jesus traumatized his soul. It was too much for him to bear. He knew Jesus was asking him to be sold out. But see, this is where it gets to be a problem. Because he didn't say, I just want you to join the church. He's telling him, I want you to be sold out. I want you to make me your priority from this day forward. I want you to forget about your past and walk into a new future with me. I don't want you to look back. I don't want you to touch this or touch. I just want you to follow me. He knew Jesus was asking him to be sold out. And let me tell y'all something. Some of y'all tremble at the fact of being sold out. Woo, God. Even today, Jesus is looking at some of us and looking for those who will be sold out. To that what we face, sometimes, some of us, y'all ready for this dilemma? This dilemma for some of us is we have too much Jesus to enjoy the world. And then on the other hand, we have too much of the world to enjoy Jesus. So now what does that mean? Let me tell you what that means. When you got too much Jesus to enjoy the world, I'm a witness. You see, I was brought up in church. I knew about heaven and hell. I didn't know Jesus like I know him now. But I knew what I was doing was sending me to hell. And when you know what you're doing is sending you to hell, you got some apprehensions. Some stuff you don't even want to do. You want to, you want to go out there and do something else, but at the same time you say, I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> you see, you got too much Jesus in you to really enjoy the work. You in the party, you alone. Everybody dancing, you feel different. You got too much Jesus to even enjoy the work. You can't enjoy the work when you're thinking about you going to hell. <laughs> it's hard to get past that door. It's hard to get past that door when you think that if I'm still out here, the rapture take place. I'm out here in the club. My goodness, that's in your head. I know what I'm talking about. You got too much Jesus in you. Hey, you fall. 
Because, see, we don't want to dwell in his presence. We don't want to stay there and pass in his presence. But we'll get up from a five-minute prayer and say, I said everything I can do this. I said it in five minutes. We'll get up from a five-minute prayer and then we'll watch, binge watch TV all night. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we got too much world to enjoy Jesus. And when we got too much world to enjoy Jesus, we just like this cat here. He had too much world to recognize Jesus was his deliverance and surrender to him. And say, whatever it takes, God, I'll follow you. Yeah. You know how it is. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Huh? Amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? See, God is looking for people who want to be completely sold out. I don't want to quit right here. See, you got to understand, sir. God is not looking for people who are going to pretend. That is who he's looking for. He's not looking for people who just want to go through the motions. He's looking at people. He was looking for people who look in the mirror and say, God, do something with me. God, change my life and change my heart. I want to be yours. I want you to be my, my God. And you, you, you control every area of my life for the rest of my life. I want you to be Lord of my life. That's what God is looking for. For us to be sold out. And come what may, I'm going to be a child of God. I'm going to say what Paul says for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the life I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You gotta get to the place where you say, God, I'm willing to sacrifice whatever it costs. I don't care what it costs, God. I'd rather have you than the stuff. I'd rather have you than the things. I'm ready to give up everything and follow you. The whole song writer said, give up the law to follow Jesus. I'm turning from my worldly ways. I step Peace. 
and you started, I mean, you know, we, we're not the kind of people that beg for money, right? But people that have been faithful in giving to the rich. And I want to tell you, thank God for you. It's like you realize this is your house. Well, not you know, it's God's house, but you know, you're one of the stewards of this house. And you realize that. Thank you. 